Hello everybody, welcome to Talk About House, I'm Todd. I'm Juana. Okay, so we are gonna talk about theory number 274, <laughs> why the housing market will crash. It commercial real estate, the commercial real estate market, when office space crashes, <laughs> it will take out residential with it. Literally, that's like we've gone through, Juana, can you count all the different ways real estate was supposed to have already crashed? I can if I stop laughing long enough. <laughs> no, I mean, literally, we've heard every, okay, the recession would do it, interest rates would do it. Um, I mean, you know, baby a, a war somewhere was going to crash it. Uh, the baby boomers were going to do it. The baby boomers. Oh, my God. They're all going to be dead within a year, and all those houses will just be available. That would They would flood the market. Yes. They're all going to die tomorrow. All the damn baby boomers. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Oh, uh, so wait, let's not forget. Um, what was it? Uh, credit cards were going to do it. Uh, oh, credit cards! Yeah. Student loans were going to do it. Yes. Um, the sun rising was going to do it. <laughs> Everything was going to do it. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about this because it's very important to understand exactly what commercial real estate is and how it's different and why there's a problem. Okay, so this is really exciting, so please stay with us. Uh, we're not gonna bore you, we're just gonna give you lots of interesting information, including some things that you might not know. So I'm gonna start with one thing that you might not know. Can I start with that? Yeah, tell them something they don't know. Okay, so you know how you have, um, you might have a residential loan, right? You have a 30-year loan. Did you know that real estate loans for commercial properties are not 30-year loans. They are generally somewhere between six and 10-year loans. Did you know that? Can I give them a second one? Yeah, go for it. Oh, I'm so excited. I told you this would be exciting. Um, second part, did you know that because commercial real estate loans are for a much shorter term, they have a balloon payment, right? Because they're not amateurized over uh, or the 10-year loan, they're actually amortized for a longer period, but they come due in 10 years, right? So let's say you have a 30-year commercial, that you have a, a commercial loan, it's amortized maybe over 25 years, but you've got a balloon due in 10. So after 10 years, you either pay off the loan or you have to refinance. But what happens in an environment like we have today, where maybe you had a commercial real estate loan for maybe, let's say, four or five percent and now maybe you can only get it for maybe 10 or 12 percent so what do you do well you have a couple choices one choice is to go ahead and refinance it for 10 or 12 percent and, and get another loan another choice is to actually get a loan extension now this is different because residential real estate we can't do that right when our loan is because our loan is generally to um, to maturity which means that we, we actually pay off our loan but when balloon payment. Right. Well, but in this case, there's a balloon payment. Like with, um, so in commercial, you can actually get a loan extension. So what does that look like? Well, maybe you go to your lender and say, hey, you know, I need more time for that balloon payment. I need more time to refinance. And they do some sort of arrangement with you. That arrangement is generally expensive. Uh, and it's for a fixed amount of time. Sometimes it's for a few months. Sometimes it's for a couple years. But they have to agree. But they have to agree. Yeah. So. Uh, so it, it's different than residential. So, though, so I promised you something different that you maybe didn't know. There you go. You've got two. Well, we've got more, so stay tuned. Okay, now you get Okay, the now finally I get <laughs> the mic back to go through some of the things. Oh, first thing. Yes. Okay, somebody commented in the things that they don't like the way you pronounce amortize. Amortize. Amortization. All right. Amor guy. Okay, first of all, I will say this. You, you're... First language is not English. I think it's, the problem, you have no accent. You speak perfect English. I have an accent. You have an accent. But you you actually, you, you English is your third language. It's not your first language. You it speak is, two other languages first fluently before you ever spoke in English. Yeah, but that's not that's a lame excuse. That's a lame excuse. Amortize. Amortization. I think it sounds like you're saying amateurization. <laughs> like am, an amateur. I'm an amateurization. Amortized. 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 Just it's like through it's like amortized. It's like the real estate agents can't pronounce realtor. They pronounce okay. it realtor or realtor. Yeah, anyway. Let's get on with it. Let's get on with it. Okay. So <laughs> I pulled up some headlines to show you all. Okay. okay. 
Here's the first one. Commercial real estate values are set to crater as much as 40% by 2025 in these six cities. They're set to crater. Okay, so do, do they have like a kitchen timer and it's going to go off? Yeah, the kitchen timer is t- ticking down uh, as much as 40%. The thing I hate about when they do as much as, it could be 1% mm-hmm. or 5%. It could say as much as 40 Well, it doesn't mean it'll go. It could be 40 but it could be less. So literally you're chickening out. That's like saying, oh, it could be as much as 80%. But only, it only changed 15%, but it could have been 80, but that was the most. Well, you could doesn't live- doesn't mean it has to get there. Okay, but you could live to 120, right? This Okay, uh, the six cities were, you can probably get, I'll let you guess, guess the uh, six cities. Okay. Commercial, these, are the worst, these are the ones with the highest amount that real estate, is, commercial is expected to fall. All right, um, New York City. Yep. San Francisco. Yep. Chicago. Yep. Um, Pittsburgh. No, not Pittsburgh. Um, one more guess, and I'm going to do the rest. Okay. Uh, Atlanta. Oh my God, Boston, Washington D.C., and Los Angeles. Okay. Basically, the biggest cities, and a lot of that's because people left work from home, or people just left the city. Okay. okay. Even though people who move back to New York City, rents are up. They were not back in offices. Okay. okay. See, it was a real guess because I got I only got half of it right. <laughs> okay. Um, here's another one. Morgan Stanley says commercial real estate will crash harder than during the Great Financial cri- Crisis. Ooh, I'm it will crash harder. I'm uh, I don't know who she is. Morgan Stanley. You know who that is? <laughs> she works somewhere. I don't know who she is. Okay. You, so- okay. Here's another. Here's a. Here's another one. U.S. Office, oh my God, they actually used the right word. Office real estate price is headed for severe crash, investors say. That's literally, like, in, what investors? In, you know, define severe. Right. Okay. So let, let's kind of... Let's t- talk about what what is commercial, Juana. Right. Do you tell them what commercial real estate is? All right. So a good way of figuring out what commercial is, is what type of real estate do you get a commercial loan for versus a residential loan, right? So some of our obvious, like for example, uh, maybe retail, right? That's commercial. Office space, obviously commercial. Um, how about, you know, things like um, industrial? Um, All those buildings around the airport. And- right. So, so those would be like, uh, you know, those industrial, uh, like Todd said, around the airport, like warehouses, things like that, right? Um, but then you've got other ones that you might not think of. For example, apartment buildings. Those are commercial because you have to get a commercial loan to mm-hmm. build them, okay? So it's not just office buildings. You know, it's not just um, retail. It, it, it's, it's composed of a lot of different things, right? Yeah. Now... The thing that everybody's kind of hung up on is office. Now, the reason for that is because office makes up about 41% of the commercial loans. So that means that 59% is made up of like four other classes, right? So No, it's less. I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's less. What's less? Office isn't 40% of commercial loans. Okay. No, it's much, much smaller. 40% of all delinquent loans are office loans. I'm sorry. You're right. Yeah. So... For so office is having a problem. Mm-hmm. You remember, you always have some form of delinquency, even with residential. Mm-hmm. There's always somebody in default. Mm-hmm. But office is having the problem right now. So the problem is this: it's sort of a cycle. You don't pay. You okay, Wanda? What happens if somebody says, "Hey, look, my office's space is only sixty percent full. Mm-hmm. My rents are two thirds what they were, mm-hmm. you know, previously. I don't have enough money to make." Even if I have to refi at these rates, I don't have enough money to pay. So what happens when I go to the bank and go, I can't get a 9% or 10% loan Mm -hmm. to refi my building because I don't have enough money coming to pay for it. Well, not only can you not, do you not have enough revenue coming in to pay for it, but the bank wouldn't, uh, wouldn't loan you the money in the first place because you don't have the cash flow um, that that would justify that. Because remember, uh, as a landlord, you have to have sufficient cash flow to, to, to justify that. So, so what happens is, uh, in, in those particular situations, the borrower 
uh, if they want to go ahead and refinance, they're going to have to basically put down a down payment so that they can get that loan to value uh, much closer to where it needs to be and those payments closer to where, where they need to be. And, and that obviously is problematic because a lot of people don't want to put money in, into the kitty. Yeah. One thing they can do is go back to their, their investors and say, hey, look, we need some money to buy down the thing and then we'll, we'll get financing at this percent for the rest and mm -hmm. you know we'll figure it out. The other option is they, the bank just takes it back. Right. They go, it's ours now. You're wiped out. Right. Because any equity you have is certainly not going to be enough to generally pay for the shortfall in the loan and they just take over the building and sell it to somebody else and for less. Right. So that $20 million off dollar office building that you bought and you know, maybe they say, okay, it's 15 million now and mm -hmm. someone's going to buy it for 15 million and they'll, they'll finance it. Right. Right. So what I think what's interesting to me is that while commercial has some tools that are, are useful, such as extending the loan, right? I think that's very useful. We don't have that in residential. Uh, what I haven't seen commercial do is what we did do in residential, which was short sales. Um, so I think that it's, would that yeah. would be an interesting thing to, to consider is doing a short sale. Now, they can do all kinds of interesting things with a short sale. They could do something along the lines of, uh, continuing to collect some money from the borrower while the short sale is in progress. Mm -hmm. So that lets the borrower stay in the building longer. Uh, and then when they do the short sale, then they can condition that, that, that the new buyer, if they're not paying cash, that they have to finance through the existing lender. So now that amount that, that they sell the property for, now they're getting that loan at a higher, uh, at a higher interest rate for, for the bank's purposes and maybe that helps the bank's bottom line. I think that uh, banks have an opportunity here to get creative uh, in, this, in this environment, and it'll be interesting to see uh, if they put their thinking caps on and get creative in ways that benefits both the bank and maybe the borrower. You used bank and creative in the same sentence. That is not allowed. I know. <laughs> that is uh, rule number 74, I think. Okay. The banks are not creative. No, they're not. They're creative. not creative, and they follow well, very strict. Remember, they're regulated. They follow very, very strict rules. They, they do. They do. So but a lot I, of times, think, it's they don't have the ability, or they're just not going to do it because they're banks. And right, I just think that the regulators, uh, given the opportunity, and if the banks went to them and said, "Hey, you know, uh, this would be a, this would be good for the market, be good for the bank, it'd be good for everybody," you know, can we can we do this? I think regulators might entertain something like that. Uh, it would be interesting to see if if they become uh, more flexible and if that actually helps everybody uh, at the end of the day. Because remember, uh, these banks are going to take some losses, and the idea would be to uh, mitigate these losses and and minimize these losses. And there might be ways to do that um, that they ha they're not currently that they're not currently doing. Okay, so wanna. What does this, how would this spread and take down residential real estate? Explain them the three-step process, process by which like ABC draw, connect the dots to where office space, you know, offices are being foreclosed and then somewhere a thousand miles away, a house price goes down. How does that work? It doesn't. Oh, <clears throat> is not but one, they both are real estate. One is residential, one is office or commercial. You uh, think does it have anything to do with real with residential real estate? Well, no, it doesn't. So, I mean, look, if uh, if office space is having difficulty, that doesn't mean that apartments are having difficulty. If apartments are having a difficulty, it doesn't mean that, that retail is having difficulties. If retail is having difficulties, that doesn't mean that uh, warehouses are having difficulties. I mean, they're just not related. They're not related in the same way. Yeah. So okay. uh, th these are all completely different. They have completely different clients. They have completely different interests. Uh, they have completely different economic cycles. Yep. So uh, they have nothing to do with one another. And then residential is completely outside of that, right? Uh, we know we just talked about how residential has fixed fixed rate loans, and they have them for uh, they have them to where the loan is extinguished at the end. That's not the case with commercial. 
uh, residential is just a completely different animal and it's a completely different client. Right. Yeah. There is no correlation and there is no way anything happening in, in commercial. Like if you look at Dallas, Texas, their, com their office space, although it's not transacting as much, is doing fantastic. Offices are full. People are still buying. They're still building office space. San Antonio, they're still building. Miami, Florida, they're still building. Las Vegas, they're building. I think we, I, last time I read, we have something like 200,000 square foot of office space under construction. And guess where most of it is? It's in suburbs. Right. It's so, in like downtown Summerlin or places like that where, remember, we were adding 8,000 people a month. Mm -hmm. And businesses are coming here. We need space for all these businesses to support all the people. Right. I mean, and we've sold, uh, you know, my office has sold several um, commercial properties in the last couple of months. And they weren't on the market for very long. And they sold well. We didn't have any issues. Uh, some were purchased cash. Some were, were financed. But either way, they're selling. Right. Yeah. So, yes, San Francisco. A lot of tech companies left. A lot of people left. Mm -hmm. There's not, there's, I mean, there's literally office buildings that are empty. There are office buildings where they've said, you know what? We have so few people here. We're throwing you out and we're just going to turn everything off because we can't afford to operate just to have, you know, five tenants in this, you know, six story building with, you know, 20 offices on each floor. Mm -hmm. You know, there's just, we're just going to have to close the building. There's not enough room or not enough availability. Now, there, there are some, obviously, you know, things that could happen in the future, right? Tech could come back. New technologies could, um, you know, some companies could come into the Bay Area and go, hey, new, you know, we need to build these AI, you know, server massive things. We need all this office space to build these massive, you know, AI servers. So we need hundreds of thousands of square feet. And they put them in San Francisco for maybe because that's where all the engineers are and, and the people. So there are reasons people could go back to those cities. But remember, people have left those, the six cities we mentioned, mm -hmm. they've come to places like Vegas. Mm -hmm. Like I'm sure San Diego is not having a terrible time. San Diego is pretty full. A lot of people left the Bay Area and left LA and went to San Diego. Mm -hmm. Seattle's probably not doing that bad, even though they, they have a lot of tech and probably a lot of work from home. Uh, but most cities are probably not bad. But yes, there are certainly a lot of places where commercial, especially offices, mm -hmm. having an issue. And then there's 1.5 trillion mm -hmm. coming up, I think, in the next three years that have to be refinanced, these, these balloon payments that have to be refied. And uh, David Sachs was saying he owns a building and he had like 9 million he had to refi. Mm -hmm. And it was at like 11%. Mm -hmm. And he goes, I'm not going to refi $9 million at 11%. So he just paid it off. Right. He paid off the building. So he owns the building free and clear. He was trying to leverage it, right? Because he would probably got a decent loan and he was probably making more money with his cash mm -hmm. doing something else. So, but yeah, if you have to pay 11% on a loan, you're probably like paid the thing off. Right. So everybody's situation is different. Yeah. Uh, you know, as far as um, Seattle's concerned, I think Seattle has long had a culture of work from home uh, prior to the pandemic yeah. uh, because traffic is so horrendous there. It's pretty bad. Um, you know, I mean, even if you're only having to travel, you know, 15 miles, it might take you two hours to travel that because traffic is so horrendous. So uh, the work from home culture there was going on way before the pandemic. So I think that's part of the reason why some places, even though they're tech heavy, uh, they did not suffer as much in the loss of office workers because they were already working from home. Seattle has ferries that go between the, like, the islands and across mm -hmm. the Puget Sound. They do not have decent public transportation no, but like it, New York City does. Right. So, I mean, because, you know, you've got people living, you know, in in Bellevue and um, and in Everett and all these different, you know, c communities. And and the the, um, the commute is just awful. And so people tend to, there are a lot of people that, that work from home and, and they've done so for a very long time. They, they used to have it. Uh, so, for example, um, Boeing used to have this thing where you had to come into the office once a week. And then they went to like, uh, once Zoom became um, more more popular, they went to like maybe once a month. 
Uh, so it's really interesting because you know because traffic was just so awful, and they figured out that people were just not going to be productive if they were going to be spending hours on the road every day. You know, it, it's yeah. tiresome, uh, and just people are not at their best when they've spent so much time in traffic. Right. Okay. Final word. I'll give it to you. I'm just going to say this: there is zero evidence. If if resident, first of all, if residential real estate was going to crash. Wouldn't Michael Burry, remember the guy from the big short that had looked surprisingly looks a lot like Christian Bale <laughs> would come out and publicly say, I'm shorting housing and do the, what he did before where he shorted, he bought the, basically he bet against the, the bonds that were all backed by housing and he bought positions that they wouldn't be worth anything that no one else would buy everyone, the credit default swaps, right? Wouldn't he come out and say, I'm going to short the housing market? I Even though know. you can't really short the housing market, I don't know what he was. He's do. shorting the stock market by like one point six billion. Yeah, but that's it. There's no. I don't. Not only is there's no evidence there will be a housing crash, there's zero chance that it will be taken out by the commercial crash. Mm -hmm. None. Okay, so uh, what's your take on the whole thing? Is <laughs> um, is the sky falling? on the commercial market going to take out the, re the residential market as well? Or are they completely separate church and state situations and one's not going to impact the other? Um, tell us what you think in the comments. You don't have to agree with us. We enjoy your real estate comments. So we, we welcome all of your real estate comments. Remember to like the video, subscribe, hit the notification bell, share the video, and we'll see you on the next video. Bye. Bye.